working with raster data in ArcGIS, where I'll be focusing on functions. There is, broadly speaking, five different categories of functions in ArcGIS or in Map Algebra, if you wish. We can talk about local functions, that is, functions that function on a cell by cell basis. So it can either be, for instance, sinus in a single layer, or if you have a series of layers, it can be at the same location throughout all of these layers. So a cell by cell location basis might be a correct term of talking about it. We have focal functions, and are functions that have, take a cell as its focal point and then calculates some operations on its neighborhood and then writes the result of these operations down into the location at the focal point. This type is also sometimes named a moving window because it starts with one cell in the upper corner and then moves across the entire raster layer and then set using each individual cell as the center or its focus po point then doing this calculation on the neighborhood. Um, filters are for instance an example of this type of operation. We have zonal functions where we have a externally defined zones could be uh, soil types or municipalities and then within each of these zones we do some calculations. We have a block which are some type of combination of a zonal and a focal. It's a let's say a it operates on zones like the zonal does um, but it's like a moving window but non-overlapping. So instead of moving from one cell to a neighbor cell it takes, does a calculation on one neighborhood and then moves to the next neighborhood. So we, there's no overlap in the many, uh, calculations. And finally, there are some global tools or incremental tools that um, cannot really be fitted into the other four of the classes. But we'll cover all of these five classes um, for this video. Our local functions. So as you can see they function that drawn here that we have two input layers and at the same location we do some operation and then that's written down into the same location of an output layer. There can be if it's one layer that we can use uh, operations like um, Reclass trigger operations. We can, I have mentioned the is null and set null in the video on uh, operators. So these are really not operators, but they are functions that can take a layer, and if it is null, it will return a one at the location, and if it's not a null, it will return a zero. And we have the set null that if our input layer here is larger than 5, it will send the output to no data or null. Or if it's not larger than 5, it will send the output to whatever was in our input raster. Some of the most used of these operations are multi-layer. So we have a series of layers and then we do some operations on them. Uh, calculate the statistics, mean, max, whatever. Um, do some combined, that gives, you, that gives you, combined is like an overlay operation, gives us all unique combinations of a layer, of a set of layers. So you might, might find combined as being um, the raster equivalent of a union. And then there's in some neat tools called lower and upper. To demonstrate the use of local for functions, I've prepared this data set in Arc Map, where we have its climate data and we have the mean temperature globally 
for each of the months, so January, February, March, and so on. The temperatures are given as decimal, uh, so degree, tenths of degrees. So if you put in a decimal value here, so this is 13.8 as the warmest, and minus 51.3 as the coldest of January. So these are the global average temperatures um, for January and so on down to December. I have um, set the map display to the Mollweider um, projection so that that gives us this relatively nice looking shape here. So that is our data set we can work with. So if you want to know when what is the warmest that a given place has that depends on the month. Some places in the world it's in the early parts of the year so that we have the warmest temperatures and in other parts it is in the latter parts of the year that we have um, the warmest temperatures. So when we would like to find out what is the warmest temperature at all locations and in order to do that we have our good old toolboxes so we go up and find our raster demo toolbox there and I'll just create a new model so in order to do my use my local function I will load this cell statistics and then I will switch in and then I'll just simply drag all my tools in and say that they are input rasters. So. so now it's made a nice little tool where we can see hopefully that all our months ooh, have uh, been assigned. No, it looks like it's lacking these two. Well, let's put them in manually. So, good. So now we've got all the months as input for the cell statistics. I can double click cell statistics and I would like to calculate the max. So I can do these different statistics, I can calculate the minimum value, the maximum value, whatever, uh, the mean, the range, what is the difference between the coldest and the warmest, standard deviation sums and all these other things, but others have the maximum. And it was say down in default database, that's fine, and off it goes. So that's that, I can then run my model, and shouldn't take so long and I can then add this to my display so now I have a map showing what is the warmest um, any given location and I will have something going from cold blue to red um, something like this and now we have blue as the warmest, so I'll just invert it like that. So we have from minus 8 to 32 degrees as the average warmest temperature. And um, so this is our map, final map where we have our temperature scale on where it's warmest and coldest um, or where the, what is the temperature of the warmest month independent of what month it is but let's try and see if we want to know which month is the warmest okay. so that's somewhat the same um, we will um, create a model again like the model we just did here do it I'll just clear this model out like that 
and then I'll drag in the other type of um, local function namely that these we have the lowest position and the highest position okay so I want to find the warmest month I'll use my highest position and then again I'll switch to my table of contents I've got all of these I want to analyze like that and I'll drag them onto my tool and say insert 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 Insert, 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 insert. And I'll just auto range it and zoom out. And it looks like all of the mods are there. I just double click the tool to see that they are in the right order because that's important. Because what it's going to do is going to say in the index. So if it's warmest in January, it will write, or oh, this one, one is the warmest, it will write a one. This one is the warmest about two, three, four, and then so if I check get the order wrong, I will get the months wrong. So it looks like they are all right, and I'll then say okay, and add it to display, and run it. So like that, and go back here, and we can close this thing down. So now we have our months. So we can see that the warmest months on the northern hemisphere is here in month seven. So while or down on Australia, we have the warmest in January and February. Okay. And around equator wall it's a wee bit of a mix. We have uh, warmest month. I think there's even some that has make this a specific color. Uh, we don't have any other place. Pink. So we also have some places where February is or December is the warmest month. So whenever it is the warmest depends of course on where you're located on the earth but we could use this local function to find out what was the highest temperature annually so a bit independent of its month data came from give us the highest value or the lowest or whatever the range and we can ask for having um, which month is the warmest month. So that's the use of local functions. Focal functions, or as they might also be called moving windows, is because they have a window of analysis that moves across our raster layer. So it starts in a corner and then moves this window to the next focal cell and the next focal cell and the next focal cell. And then it does a statistics within its neighborhood. It could, for instance, calculate the average. It could carry the mean of the neighborhood, how many are present, counts, whatever. Um, these neighborhood shapes, they don't have, the default is a rectangle or square, but they can be rectangular, circular, endless, so a donut shape, or a wedge um, like this one. Wedges, they are typically used um, if you have looking at um, pollution downfall, so where, how many um, addresses would be at the downwind wind from a factory. That could be one of these situations. Uh, so the analysts, um, I must admit I can't really think of the use for it, might be something. Um, circles are typically used if you have a looking for habitats for a specific thing or humans. And um, you say, okay, how many uh, bookshops or f food resources are within your hunting range. So that's um, what we use circles for. Rectangles, again there I can't really think of where we use them. 
but the squares we will use them um, typically for using filters finding maximum points things like that they can have strange shapes you can define your own ones if you wish um, again there that's um, ever advanced thing that you are used now and then but seldom so neighborhood function is that you take this neighborhood and you do a calculation and you write the result of the calculation down into the center cell your focal so that's why it has the name focal or neighborhood because this is a focal cell where the result of the calculation of the neighborhood is written down to it. Um, so basically you take the raster layer you look at the neighborhood calculate this is the values the result is written down into the center so you have do a um, a mean of these data sets you get a four majority so on this is this examples of what you get based on this data set here so that's the function the use of it um, Zonal statistics we often use if we have some external definition of an area and we want to do a calculation in that uh, zone, for instance, find out um, what is the general, what is the average elevation of lakes. And then we could have a layer that defines the lakes and then we could do a zonal statistics on our elevation based on that. Um, you can also use it to general tabulate areas, um, which will do X more or less the same. Do a cross tabulation of the layers, so you have all combinations. You can do a zonal geometry that describes the geometry of the layers um, in your output. The zonal statistics has two variations. It has as a table or as a layer. If you do use it as a table, it can do a several statistics in the zone. If you do it as a layer, you just you have to choose one statistics, and you'll then get an output layer that has the zones and then the statistics calculated within the zones, defining the areas of the zones. Typically, I find that I use um, zone defining vector, and then I can use a so this is a table because then I can join this statistics back into my vector layer. So let's look at an example in ArcMap to demonstrate the use of um, zone statistics. I have made this little um, setup here. What I have done here is that I have calculated the slope and the aspect. We will cover these in a moment. Uh, what they do and then I have used my raster calculator to find all of the areas that are facing south plus minus 30 degrees so that is 180 minus 30 180 plus 30 okay. so and then I have added this and this is this layer we're looking at so this is if I just turn this one off this is all surfaces that are focused that are facing south that are in yellow so if you look at a we can zoom in this area here we can see that we can recognize the rooftops as being what's on one side of the roof they are focusing or facing south so um I now have the buildings and if I want to know how many parts of the roof or how many square meters of the roof is focusing south because I'm going to do some calculations on where to put photoelectric um, panels I can use my zone statistics I will use my buildings to define my zones and then I will do the statistics on this layer that says that has ones where my cell is f facing south and zero where the cell is facing anything else than south. So in order to do this I'll go down 
and find my zone statistics. And I will use the one that is called zone statistics as table because then I can join my data onto my vector layer in a moment. And I have my buildings. And in my buildings, I have created an ID. Um, and uh, this is my raster. If you look at it, it says my buildings and it has a feature code. Or well, I'll prefer to use my ID, which is the same as the FID. But I have many times experienced that it FIDs or feature IDs, they can change. So I when doing this type where I'm going to do some operation then join back on it. I prefer to create a copy of the uh, feature ID. So this is just my ID, that's my my um, copy of the feature ID, use the field calculator. And then I use my raster layer and what I want to do is I just want to know how many there are. So that is the same as doing a sum. A sum will tell me exactly how many um, cells are there. We could also have used the all and that will give us all the statistics we needed. But I'll just use the sum here and say OK. And then run this model. Now that the model has finished, I can see the results if I change to this by display. I have this zone statistics down here. And what this dot has is that it has for each of my buildings in this area here, I have my ID, I have a count, an area, and a sum. So in this case, this building here had 105 cells of which the 24 of them for, was facing south. This building down here had 6,400 cells of which the 1,500 cells were facing south. So this data here um, is the result of my zone statistics. And what I then can do is of course, I can take this data here and I can then join it into my uh, vector data. So, uh, dunk, join, and I will join it based on this my ID. So that I know hasn't changed throughout these operations. And then my ID there. And then I can close this thing down. Uh, close my model down and if I now want to visualize it I can go and say that I want to use here and I want to show my sum as a fraction of the count so when it's finished looking at the fraction of the count And uh, this is an, a fraction, so if I, and this is about peculiar, it, this is one of the places where it's not a right click but a left click, format label, and this is a percentage, and the number is represented as a fraction, and I want it to give me uh, decimal places, one decimal place, like that. So now when it's finished drawing here, we can see that just get rid of these things to make it a bit clear. The, now the buildings are mapped according to how many percentage of the roof is facing south in my definition of south. So many of these green buildings, they are then facing not south and then the, the redder they are, the more percentage of the roof is facing south. So that was using the 
zonal statistics as table to generate based on my buildings. I took my buildings, used them as zones. I used this little calculation I've done to say whether or not a cell was facing south. I did my zone statistics on this, where I did a cut, there's the sum, and then I compare the sum of the count of um, cells in each of them, so I can do a information on how many percent of the cells within each building is facing south. Block functions. Um, and you can see that it is if you have a block function, we have non overlapping neighborhoods as opposed to our focal function where we have overlapping neighborhoods so because we just move one cell along. Um, I have difficulties in thinking of any situation where I've used block functions, um, but there might be a good solution use for them. And finally, we have all of these global things. We have things about distance, we covered in another video. We can um, do things like extracting objects. We can generalize, so reducing the cell size. We can you do what's called a region group, which is sometimes a very useful tool. It identifies uh, all cells of the same value that touch each other. So it creates, I have mentioned that in raster data we do not have a object identity. We only have cells with the value of lake in it. But if you want to know how large our lakes are, we need this object identity. So what it can do is then create, take our lake layer and then create groups out of each of those connected lake cells. And then we can calculate things like area. So there's a special one down there. Then there are application specifics. Um, there are tools looking for hydrology, tools looking for groundwater, and then there are tools looking for at surface. I have already used these surface tools. Um, I'll just short to show them because these are the tools that are using here in this model. I had calculated uh, down here, I had calculated the aspect and the slope, which are these two surface tools. What we do when doing surface calculations is relatively simple. We take a focal statistics, really, have a center cell, in this case E, and then we calculate to how is the order between um, how steep it is and we also calculate then the direction of the steepest. This is basically just the math of it. Um, by calculating from our cell to its neighbors and then calculating the most the, the steepest slope that is our aspect. So, this is the trick for doing the calculations of aspect and slope. It's a, really just a neighborhood operation. So, if we look at the results of it, I have here um, Flexbert, Flexbert Elite, and here we have the L photograph, and here we have the slope, and we can sort of see that the slope is really steep on the edge of the buildings and then here on the around the trees this is where we have the highest slopes which is not really surprising while of course the slope is very close to zero on the roads and something in between on the roofs our aspect tool which is the one that we used to see if something is pointing south we have again our aerial photograph same area and here we have the aspect and where you can see which way the roofs are facing so we have here a northern facing 
roof, this red one, this part is also facing north, while this part of the roof is facing south. This part here is in east and west. So, based on just the cell and its neighborhoods, we can use our little formula here to calculate the slope and the aspect. If the result in our map is this here, here we have the aspect of um, of all our of our Copenhagen area. Um, you can see this is Marmorkirken. Sorry, this is Marmorkirken. This is a mm -hmm. Um So um, we can see how this tool works. Of course, we're here in the lakes. It's a bit odd which way it's, um, the slope is of the of the lakes. But, uh, sorry, the aspect of the lakes. If I look at my um, my slope, however, just add that to display, like that. Um, what we can see is that, of course, the slope of the lakes is very little, while the slope of Mount Mokirken, of course, is higher. So in order to understand the, the surface, we need to look at both the slope and the aspect and typically we ignore the aspect if it's completely flat um, or if it's for most applications we say that if it is less than so and so many degrees of um, slope then we, um, we, we we consider this to be flat there's one thing to be aware of with the slope tool which is oh um, sorry yeah my model. If we look at the slope tool, it has only one option to be aware of, and that is this one. Do I want it to, to be in degrees or in a percent rise? So we have here we have between zero and ninety degrees, and then you can have it in percent rise. So typically, uh, how steep a road is is given with a warning sign not as degrees, but as a percent rise. Um, it also has this set factor, which we in Denmark normally don't have to change. We just leave it to one. It's only if your values of your set is different, the units of your set is different from your units of your X and your Y. In um, England, uh, elevation is typically given as feet, and then the and while the X and Y is given by as meters, and then you'll have to give a Z ax uh, option here to convert from feet to meter to make them comparable. But that's um, luckily something we don't have to worry about in Denmark, so we leave this as one. So that was the slope and the aspect tool. And with this, I'm finished talking about functions and how which type of functions we have to operate on uh, rasters in ArcGIS. Hope you liked it. See you. Bye.